York City. It's the Gary Nash Show. Hi everyone, I'm Gary Knoll, broadcasting and video streaming live from our studios in New York City, and I'd like to welcome you. You can watch today's show by going to Progressive Radio Network Facebook. Today, we're going to look at fast food availability and how it's linked to more heart attacks, University of Newcastle, which is in Australia. We have about 15 other important stories on health and healing. All of our stories come from peer-reviewed journals done at respected institutions, but not generally shown in the mainstream media. They all have something in common. We are able to live a longer and healthier life if we become aware of this information and can actualize it. Also, since people are going back to school in the near future, we are going to play you a short clip about what to be aware of that's happening on not all, but many, especially the Ivy League colleges. In fact, over the next week or two, I'll be playing clips from professors from institutions who have been attacked because they didn't warn some of the students that they may be talking about something like critical thinking. And the idea of talking about critical thinking without first warning the student so they didn't feel uncomfortable meant that the teachers were attacked. So we've gotten the footage of how they were attacked, the vitriol, the, uh, the vulgarity, the loud and obnoxious screaming, the physical violence that the students said was justified because someone wanted to speak on a topic that would help them be more critical thinkers in a very civil manner. So where is the disconnect? Why isn't the media focusing on this? Why has the left encouraged this? What the hell has happened to civil discourse? We're going to be exploring that in some depth. Also, I'm going to be doing a commentary from Chris Hedges, one of our greatest intellects and critical thinkers. Remember, he's a Pulitzer Prize winning journalist. He has reported from all over the world. And yet you wouldn't know he exists today because his background and his current efforts have been expunged from the, the mainstream media. Why? Why not have him on, if nothing else, to cause an interesting debate with people that hold uh, different points of view? But there are about a hundred journalists who are not invited any longer into the media except for the alternative media. But then they go out of their way to destroy the alternative media to cast doubts on its legitimacy. So, in comes comes, uh, companies like Microsoft and Google and Facebook and Apple, all the major telecom companies, and they all have something in common. They want to control our reality, some for purely economic reasons and others more diabolical. We have a very important, absolutely, in my mind, when I watched it, Uh, an engrossing and an eye-opening look at how the Internet was created, who created it, who controlled it then, who's uh, credited with controlling it up to this day. You thought it was just so you can get better access to information, share your thoughts and photographs and what you ate for breakfast. None of that is relevant to the people who control it and want to control you. So we have... um, the Corbett Report, on tomorrow evening's program for a full hour. I'll be doing about a 15-minute introduction as to how much privacy do you actually have in your life and why people don't care that their privacy, their rights, the Constitution, their rights are being eviscerated by these, these individuals. And then you'll see a really dynamic and fascinating look at all the people that you didn't know were involved behind the scenes. And that will be something for you to pay attention to. That's tomorrow evening. Today, we're going to start a series with um, Dr. Suzanne Humphreys on vaccines, starting as if you're a lay person who knew nothing about vaccines and you believe in vaccines are safe and effective. Good. 
I would support them fully if they were. I support your right to take a vaccine if that vaccine has been shown not to cause you harm. But what is my moral and ethical and journalistic responsibility if I know something's wrong because I've done my homework, I've been intentionally aware because I've done intentional research, not just as a layperson, but as a scientist, do I have any obligation to share my concerns? Or should I just let people be exposed to toxins, whether it's 5G from electromagnetic frequencies or genetically engineered foods with glyphosate or the amount of sugar we're eating and the types of sugar and alcohol? And that's why each day I try to share insights and information that challenge the prevailing consensus and show you that there's good science supporting why you should be concerned. So she's going to give you a classroom over the next maybe five to seven days, each day a short piece on what you need to know. And I'll take on some other issues, including how rich have the rich become recently? How about over $240 billion and just 25 families, new money that we have given them? I think it comes down to something like over a million dollars a minute the Walton family is earning. A minute. 60 minutes an hour. 24 hours a day. And yet they're paying their workers $11 an hour. And some of those workers are having to sleep in their cars and have two jobs and don't have health insurance. So I think it's time for a conversation on why as a society we have not addressed in any meaningful way the income inequality and why we're expected, if we're not the elite, to suffer the consequences of being considered uninformed and lower class and caste citizens in America. And I've written a commentary on that I'll be sharing. So that's what's coming today and tomorrow. But we always begin with the latest in health and healing. And I've noticed something. When going through a lot of the boroughs in Manhattan, uh, or around Manhattan, like the Bronx and Queens and Staten Island and Harlem, one of the very first things you notice is how few clean food establishments there are, like healthy farmers markets. There are some on some days of the week that have some produce and very good produce, and it's locally grown produce, which is what I support. But what about what people normally eat, the average person, on a day-to-day basis? You have an abundance of unhealthy foods, foods that will cause heart attacks. Why isn't that a public health emergency? If we can become so concerned about mass shootings, and we should be, and they're real underlining causes, of which one is assault weapons, but the other is the medications that people are on that we seem to be in a position where we never talk about that in the media, We may talk about them having a mental condition, but we don't talk about the medication they were on. Just like 20 to 22 vets every day blow their brains out, and we talk about post-traumatic stress disorder, which most have, but we never talk about the 100% of these vets that were on medications, including medications that side effect is suicide. So we're a society that is not able at this time to come to grips with anything representing real reality. I mean, as an entire society, we're not dealing with it. We're not dealing with global warming. Little tiny countries are uh, planting 300 million trees in one day, and we haven't planted a single tree as a part of our effort. Global warming, we've done just the opposite. We're working with Bolsonaro, this this, uh, fascist who's even more fascistic than Donald Trump. That's hard to imagine. And he's intent upon destroying the rainforest to and and the Amazon, we do that, it's game over. It is absolutely game over. Everything on the planet will be affected. But why isn't there some movement in Congress not to trade with Brazil, to put a moratorium on all trade with Brazil, and then to bring the world community together to talk with this man and say, what you're doing is not about you and your power, is about you in a powerful position dictating that the lungs of the planet should be destroyed for gain. But we're not doing that, are we? 
No. So that's why I'm doing a whole series of why we're not doing things, what we need to do personally, even if our governments, local, state, and federal, resist our efforts. We shouldn't stop. From the University of Newcastle comes a study, and they found that areas with a higher number of fast food restaurants have more heart attacks, and uh, that's important. The study also found that for every additional fast food outlet, there were four additional heart attacks per 100,000 people each year. And this was presented at the annual scientific meeting of the Cardiac Society of Australia and New Zealand. And that's important. And it was published in the European Society of Cardiology. So now imagine when you go into any uh, place in New York, you're going to see fast food. So I took my camera crew up. And I'm going to ask um, Travis, and I'm going to ask uh, Sharon, and I'm going to ask Valerie here in the office, find the clip where I'm up in Harlem on 125th Street interviewing people as they came out of a McDonald's. And what was interesting, some of them were actually members of my audience. Yeah, uh, talk about a surprise. And what they were eating and the justification they got, did for that. And then we went down 125th Street to a wonderful oasis. And it's a, a juice uh, restaurant. And there were lines out the door and down the block. And I interviewed dozens of those people. I spent a couple hours there. Why are you here? Why are you having a glass of juice? And their response was interesting. Now, here's the interesting part of this. Both the people coming out of McDonald's eating that food and people coming out of this uh, Harlem fresh organic juice, both were telling me the same identical thing about how good juicing is and a healthy diet. And yet, one group of people were eating unhealthy foods and another group were eating healthy foods. So have we gotten to a place in our life where we become detached from the consequence of cause and effect? Do somehow you think you're not going to get heart disease or cancer? Yesterday, we had a room filled. We have no more room, by the way. Don't call uh, our, our arthritis group and our diabetes group are packed. And we're in a clinical study. And uh, the people are taking it seriously. But when you talk with the people, were you aware when you were eating unhealthy food, the meat, the fried food, the sugars, the pizzas, the colas, that there would be a consequence. And they said, yes and no. I knew it wasn't good food, but my emotions overtook my choices or my laziness or my comfort. I didn't want to go to the discomfort of going to a farmer's market or a health food store and buying stuff and bring it home, preparing it when I could make a call and suddenly a pizza would be delivered. Comfort. So how comfortable are you with your arthritis? and your diabetes. And almost always, there's three or four other conditions like heart disease or high blood pressure or depression, which is very common for people who have high blood depression, high blood pressure, depression, heart disease, depression, and cancer go together. So we're living knowing that the choices we're making are not going to end up good for us, but we keep pushing back the idea that today's not the day it's of reckoning. Maybe tomorrow. And then we know that all of the New Year's Eve resolutions are broken by one minute after midnight on New Year's Day. So we have adapted to a negative and toxic maladaptation society. We have maladapted to everything. We've maladapted to the Jeffrey Epsteins. Oh, by the way, did we? I'm going to give you my point of view, not now, but we're doing some research on the Mossad and some other connections Jeffrey had and his financial benefactor had that no one's brought up before I tell you my opinion. Um, but imagine he came back to New York society after he had been convicted of pedophilia and was a sexual predator, after he had spent some time down there, uh, 13 or 16 months in a uh, local jail where he was allowed out to work all day and just had to come back at night. And he was embraced by New York society. He was embraced by the very people that should have said, look at you. You know, what you've done. You do not deserve our friendship. You do not deserve to be in any of these, you know, um, circles. No, he was partying like it was no tomorrow. 
And a lot of what he did came after his first conviction. What does it tell you about the people, the type of people in that social group? So I'm going to talk about class, uh, class warfare in an upcoming program. In any case, so you should walk right by a fast food restaurant and just say this. Turn and look at the restaurant and say, I could go in there. I could eat something very sweet and soft. I could eat something very crunchy and spicy. But what am I doing to my heart, my brain, my eyes, my liver, my kidneys? I'm punishing them because of my maladaptive value system. I don't value my health. I don't value my life. I don't value my chi. Shouldn't we have discussions on this? Shouldn't we bring bring in behavioralists? Shouldn't we bring in humanistic psychologists? Shouldn't we be asking people, what would happen if you chose not to? to go into that restaurant, not to eat that meal. And their argument is, well, I didn't think it would be that bad. I remember some years ago, our running and walking club, and we had a ball yesterday uh, running in the park. We do every Sunday. And we were running around the reservoir, and there must have been 200 of us. And uh, I saw a guy who was running ahead of us and I had seen him for years and on that morning we were probably you know 30 feet from him. we were going to run around the side of him because we were running a faster pace and he just dropped down I mean just boom just dropped and what was interesting he did it at the north end of the reservoir and right there at the boathouse north end of the reservoir in Center Park there was an ambulance so when the ambulance saw this guy drop they were out of the, they were on him in in under a minute and we had some physicians in our group, and everybody tried to help him. And he was dead. And, uh, and so I, we stopped the run, and because uh, that really shakes people up, as it should. And for some people, it was the first time they said they'd ever see someone die. And I said, we're all going to die, but have we lived a righteous life before we die? Have we maximized our spiritual, emotional, moral, creative experience in this life before we pass? Have we lived a legacy of kindness and joy and caring for others? Have we lived in service to other people? So I did this lecture and to give people a chance to think. And then I said, remember, that guy probably has some family members. I, ke- I saw him come out of a building, so I knew he lived right off fifth on fifth avenue and but he was running thinking as long as he ran that's all he had to do when you are we're the only holistic running and walking club in america and about thirty thousand over 45 years have done the new york city marathon but thousands have done other races and get kept in shape and are still still healthy and in fact i i mentioned to them uh, how wonderful it was when about a hundred of us went to do the first London Marathon. We did all the first marathons. We did the Montreal Marathon and the uh, Waterfront Marathon, the Jersey Shore Marathon, the San Francisco Marathon, the Jamaica Marathon, the Los Angeles Marathon, uh, the Marine Corps Marathon. All these, every first marathon we did. That's a unique place to be in history. And it was so much fun to do it with a whole group of people. But I never will forget this. One morning we went out from the hotel we were staying in and we got good race because there were so many of us, so we stayed in a really nice hotel right on um, right on Hyde Park. And Hyde Park, if you've never been to London, it's a wonderful place to go. The United Kingdom is a beautiful country with wonderful people and some really historically significant places to see. And, uh, and anyhow, we're running on the park, and it was early, and no one else was in the park running. And it was just like the movie um, that uh, was about running the marathon, years ago, uh, Chariots of Fire. We were running in silence, and we are just running like a group of gazelles. It was just beautiful to see. So anyhow, here we are, and we're seeing a man who now his family and friends would no longer be able to ever speak with him again, yet he thought that today wouldn't be his day. So this is the takeaway message. Learn something from the philosophy of Buddhism. Don't overattach and understand you have no more time. 
So if you have no more time, what will you do with the time you have to make it more meaningful than what you've done in the past with your time? And just appreciating this gift of life and the gift of the time that we do have suddenly refocuses your perception so you don't waste it. You don't engage in negativity and toxic thoughts and gossip and and running through life like a victim where you lose the capacity to change anything. And that's why when you stop at a fast food restaurant, understand you've just taken away more time off what little you have left. When you order in that pizza, when you drink the alcohol socially, anything you do, you're taking time away and you're not going to get it back. Calcium is the key to age-related memory loss. This is according to University of Leicester. Now, what do I mean? Research at the university is showing us how and why cognitive functions such as memory and learning become impaired with age. A paper published recently um, in a neuroscience journal shows that a crucial factor is calcium levels in specific cells in the brain. Make it even simpler. As we get older, our memory starts to fail and it becomes harder to learn new things. Now, it would not be unreasonable to assume that this is caused by brain cells gradually dying off, but it doesn't happen. So what causes age-related cognitive impairment? The answer lies in synopsis, the electrical chemical connections between neurons that use neurotransmitter molecules to create the web of functions within the central nervous system. And that's what they found, and crucial to that was the behavior of looking at whether calcium levels in the hippocampus, part of the brain necessary for learning and memory, might play a role. And the answer was, yes, it does. So every day, make sure you're taking some calcium, possibly calcium citrate, C-I-T-R-A-T-E, maybe about 800 milligrams a day, same amount of magnesium from citrate. You want to divide it to uh, 400 in the morning, 400 in the afternoon would be great and have better thinking, better brain. And finally... Ashwagandha. Ashwagandha is A-S-H-W-A-G-A-N-D-H-A. Ashwagandha. It mediates apoptosis. And uh, this apoptosis, it's it's pronounced two different ways, but it's it's A-P-O-P-T-O-S-I-S, and they frequently drop the P, the second P, so it's apoptosis. It is program cell death and in breast cancer cells. So, if you're taking ashwagandha, you have a better chance of killing breast cancer cells. And that helps with the mitochondria. This was published at University of Pittsburgh. So that's the latest in health and healing and and some of the things we're going to be sharing this week. And uh, we'll do the best we can every single day. And tomorrow I'm going to talk about why taking naps helps us make wiser decisions. A University of Bristol study. We have a lot of stuff that we look at and read, and we read all everything before we select it. So we're going to take a break and come back in just a moment. We have a lot to share. And by the way, I realize a lot of you don't have real access to the Internet, especially some of the older people. They've told me that, and that's why they appreciate that uh, – um, I give out numbers so they can, wherever they're at, they can pick up a telephone, just a regular old hardline phone or a cell phone, or they can listen over the Internet. Let me give you the numbers to listen live each day. Please write this down, because you never know when land-based stations, for whatever their reasons, may choose no longer to carry this program. And that has happened. So, here are the numbers. First up is listen um I want you to listen live, and let me see that number. I'm not, one second, I'm not seeing our progressive number. No. No, listen live. 605, found it, 605, 605-561-7900, 605-562-7900, 605-562-7900. But like most people, you listen over their archives, and that archive number is 701-719-9976. Back in a moment. Please stay with us.
Hi, everyone. I'm Gary Knoll. I'm going to get with a commentary in a moment, but I want to uh, share with you some information on vaccines. And here's the importance. A lot of people are only getting their vaccine information from their doctors and people who have not done their homework or who have a bias and have an interest in maintaining the status quo. Remember, your doctor makes money off these vaccines, lots of them. Either way, I believe in freedom of choice. It's your body. My hope is that with the choice you make, you make an intelligent choice. Think it through. Think of the consequences of every choice when you're doing, dealing with your body. Don't just do it on impulse or because some authority figure told you. So now you're going to hear Dr. Suzanne Humphreys in just part one of our 101 classroom on the air of vaccines. That doesn't seem to be loading either, so we have a little glitch there. Now, don't be alarmed by what I'm about to say. Most of you are going to be happy at college, and you will thrive there, but you need to know what to expect. Coming up next on The Factual Feminist, how to negotiate your way through the wacky sexual politics on campus. Now, colleges throughout the United States are carried away with eccentric gender politics. Now, in general, the higher the tuition, the greater the eccentricity. And at schools that have more working class population, the students often have more pressing concerns than finding new ways to be offended. But as an incoming freshman, many of you will be subject to special training sessions and introduced to a new vocabulary with unusual terms like trigger warnings, othering, microaggression, male privilege, and safe spaces. Outside speakers, especially comedians, will be called out and boycotted for breaches of sensitivity. And colleges are changing their mission. Truth-seeking is being replaced by the more sensitive goal of making everyone, especially female students, feel safe and validated. Ideas that get in the way of this mission may not be tolerated. Well, here are three survival tips custom-tailored to your political views, plus a fourth bonus tip for everybody. Number one. If you are a libertarian or conservative, no one is that concerned with your feelings. That's actually a good thing. <laughs> You're going to face a challenging intellectual environment. And according to a recent UCLA study, there are nearly five times more liberal professors than conservative professors on college campuses. Your views are going to be tested every day. But most of your teachers will treat you respectfully. So uh, your ideas are going to face critical scrutiny, and you may end up revising or abandoning some of them. And again, that's a good thing. That's what education is supposed to be about. And it's something many liberal students are missing. Now, what is not good is that a noisy minority of students and a few professors will see you as the embodiment of evil. If you express your opinions vigorously, some classmates may complain to school authorities that your very presence makes them feel unsafe. Well, there is a bright side. Even at schools overrun by the new orthodoxy, you will find great friends and allies, male and female, and professors too, whether they agree with you or not. Now, if you are liberal and idealistic and also a woman, you face a different set of risks. <laughs> when you get to campus, you're going to find a large and excited group of gender activists, students and some professors eager to recruit you to their cause. And they're going to present you with shocking statistics on sexual violence on campus and theories about an oppressive uh, uh, patriarchy. They're going to tell you how mistreated and traumatized you are. Now, it's going to seem new and exciting to you and maybe a way to make new friends and fight injustice at the same time. And you're going to be tempted to sign up. Just be aware that most of the victim statistics you're going to hear are wildly exaggerated. And the theories about women's oppression, they're twisted, surreal. As for trigger warnings and safe spaces, these are infantile. These are the opposite of empowerment. Now, it's the fashion on many campuses to treat women as, as delicate flowers, fragile little birds, well, most of you are tough and resilient, and the gender activists I am describing will probably say to you, don't listen to her, don't take her word for anything. Well, that's true. You shouldn't take my word on these matters. You shouldn't take anybody's word. Think for yourself, and remember that your feminist foremothers fought and won a battle for your right to be educated on a par with men, and they knew you were tough, and they wanted to have, for you to have opportunity to put that strength to use. Well, don't waste it by falling captive to a pointless ideology or indulging in victimhood. Take serious classes in philosophy, science, history. Avoid courses that luxuriate in female oppression. Third bit of advice, if you are a liberal and idealistic man, 
you may face an even greater risk. You probably think of yourself as open-minded, well-intended, progressive, but many on campus will not see you that way. Today, many college women practice gender profiling, and it's the fashion among these activists to judge men by the worst members of their sex and women by the best. <laughs> so many of your attempts to exonerate yourself or your friends will be dismissed as mansplaining. To save yourself from excommunication, you'll be asked to engage in a fair amount of self-flagellation and male bashing. But don't do it. Have some dignity. Don't be the guy who sends tweets like this. Today's campus manias, they're not going to last. Sooner or later, the age-old virtues of higher education will reassert themselves. Free speech, intellectual diversity, open inquiry, vigorous competition of ideas, mutual respect. And if you learn to be a critical, independent thinker yourself, you can play a part in this intellectual renaissance. Well, let me know what you think about today's politically charged... <clears throat> Good. Uh, we need to know that because... Those the people who are radicalizing campus, including the group that caused a professor to lose his job, an ultra-liberal professor, ironic, because as one woman was screaming at the top of her lungs uh, with 400 students around this man who was trying to be reasonable, he said, I want, I want to share how we should be thinking more critically. I'm not here to tell you what to think. And she yelled out, and you can hear her. I'm going to sh play the piece this week. She says, no, your whole job is to make me feel comfortable and, and, and safe here. Well, that's insane. You can't find more safe places in America today than on college campuses. So this small group, you don't represent everyone. There's 104 million independent people who want nothing more to do with the corporatization and weaponization of speech, ideas, and the educational system. And they're watching. And they hope that that day where people are able to share their points of view without being demonized and criticized will be around the corner. Fear versus fear. The old rules of politics no longer apply. It's according to Chris Hedges. What's that mean? It means that the only language understood by Donald Trump and his courtier of con artists and billionaires and generals and misfits and Christian fascists and a Democratic Party that is sold out is fear. Calling out Trump's lies and racism does not matter. Calling out his nepotism and corruption does not matter. Calling out the criminality of his administration does not matter. Calling out his incompetence and idiocy does not matter. Calling out the abject surveillance of the ruling, uh, subservience of the ruling class to corporate power does not matter. Trump and his Democrat Party opponents are immune to moral persuasion. The more we engage in this empty, a kabuki theater with its predictable outlandish outbursts, usually from Trump, and the predictable outraged responses, usually from Democrats, the more certain our government paralysis and corporate tyranny. The drivel and invective that passes for political discourse is a giant hamster wheel that goes nowhere that masks the root causes of our political and economic decline and fractures the population into warring camps that increasingly communicate through violence, which is why the United States has suffered mass shootings with three or more fatalities more than 30 times just this year. We will save ourselves only by pitting power against power. And since our two major political parties slavishly serve corporate power, and have few substantial differences on nearly all major issues, from imperialism to unfettered capitalism, we must start from scratch. The political personalities, including those on the left, such as Alexandria Casa cortez and Bernie Sanders and, and others, are distractions. They have no power within the Democratic Party, as Nancy Pelosi often reminds us. They serve to reduce po politics to personal feuds the currency of the vast reality show perpetrated for the profit of corporate media. The daily back and forth of these personalities diverts our attention from the rapid consolidation of wealth and power by the ruling elites. And I'm going to deal with that on an upcoming program, probably tomorrow. I'll show you the 25 leading families in the world and how no one is talking about 
the massive amount of wealth they're accumulating, and also the tax cuts. Look at it carefully and honestly and objectively. It didn't help anything trickle down to anyone below it. It didn't increase the average wage of the average worker. It didn't help people pay their bills. It was all facade. From the beginning, the get-go, it was intended to enrich the corporations, and they bought back their own stock by the hundreds of billions of dollars, which meant that if you have less stock in the market, let's say Apple or Google, and you buy back 100 million shares or 500 million shares, that means there's less stock available, which means the value of the stock that you do have becomes worth more. And that's how many of these major corporate executives make huge, huge astronomical bonuses. But what does it do for us? Not a damn thing. So, the degradation of the ecosystem into a toxic wasteland and the eradication of basic freedoms and rights, the American political system is not salvageable. I've told you this over many decades. It will be overthrown in a mass uprising, a version of which we saw recently in Puerto Rico, where nonviolent Puerto Ricans who had no power, they weren't wealthy, they didn't own business, they didn't head banks, they weren't part of some investment fund, they weren't in the body politic, they're just regular Puerto Ricans, decent, loving human beings who had been left out of the recovery left out of having their homes and businesses rebuilt, left out of having safe places where they could actually enjoy life. But that's a vast swath of the global population. Coming back yesterday to my office, I was driving in a car with the the uh, cab driver was uh, talking about Yemen. He's from Yemen. And he told me, he said, uh, because we were talking about where was he from? He said, Yemen. And I said, are you a Houthi? He said, no, no, no. He says, the vast majority of people living in Le- Lebanon, uh, excuse me, in Yemen are not Houthis. They're just, they're, they're people who want a quality of life, a quiet quality of life, and it's all been destroyed. He said, I just returned from the company. He said, American bombs and planes built in America and depleted uranium from all your ammunitions are making everyone there sick. He said, I was there for a month and I got sick. And he said, I work at this job as a cab driver, and Uber's putting us out of business, and, and Lyft is putting out us business. And he said, and right now that we had about uh, 27,000 cabs in New York, and now we're down to 13,000. There's only about 5,000 on the road. He said, I'm working seven days a week, seven days a week. I don't have a day off because I can't afford the rent in my apartment. It keeps going up. But why aren't your, your people, average Americans, talking about all the children and people in in my country, who are dying because of your government supporting Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates. Why don't your body politicians get up and protest? I said, well, we have a few who have, but only a handful, and they're not the ones that we pay attention to. So you see, all around the world, we are making the globe uninhabitable, especially for the poor. And the rich will feed like ghouls off the mounting human misery. These are the two stark options, and we have very little time left. The Democrats, if they had a functioning political party with any ethic and decency and were not owned completely and managed completely by corporations, could easily displace Trump and demolish the Republican Party in electoral landslide after landslide. From poll after poll, as Charles Derby points out in his book, Welcome to the Revolution, we know what the majority of Americans want. A whopping 82% think wealthy people have too much power and influence in Washington, with 70% singling out large businesses having too much power. Nearly 80% support stronger rules and enforcement of regulations on the financial industry. But you and I know that's not going to happen. The Clintons and Obama and Bush loved Wall Street, and Wall Street loved them. Look at all those worthless lectures that were being uh, given to the Clintons for uh, uh, paid $200,000 to $300,000 for a short little lecture of meaninglessness. That's Wall Street saying, thank you, this is our pay-to-play give back. You're not going to reign in Wall Street. You're not going to have any law in America pass that's going to make any difference, and you can't. That's how 
captured the entire system is. Nearly half of Americans think economic inequality is very big, and 34% concede it's modestly big. Almost 60% of registered voters and 51% of registered Republicans favor raising $18,000 from uh, from 14000 the maximum amount that workers can make, and still be eligible for earned income tax credit. A staggering 96% of Americans, including 96% of Republicans, believe money and politics is to blame for dysfunction of the American system. Yet, we're not taking money out. We're not demanding it. We're not on a general strike. We haven't showed up in Washington, D.C. saying take every dollar out of politics completely. Ban all lobbyists, all lobbyists, from entering a person's office. Make it a federal offense. You go into a lobbyist, your lobbyist, or a contractor, you go into a, a public servant's office, you go to jail. Watch things change. We should have a minimum wage that's not $12 an hour, but a living wage, starting at 15 and going up from there. These are just some thoughts that we are not talking about, and we need to, because nothing that I see in America is getting better. All you have is a hierarchy. It's not a patriarchy. It's not a mo- it is a democratic hierarchy and a Republican hierarchy. It is a, it is a duopoly controlled by the richest families and richest individuals in the world, and they don't have one scintilla of moral fiber in the entirety of the Washington complex of all of them. That's the disdain I have for our Senate, for I have for all the people who pretend that somehow they care about us. And you and I both know they don't give a damn about anything in our lives except how they can exploit it. Promises, live in euphemisms, live in platitudes, and do nothing to de America, to improve our poverty levels, to take people off the streets and put them in decent living conditions, to have proper immigration where people are not treated as if they're criminal to begin with. So we have a lot of work to do. The trouble is I don't see the people in Washington, with few exceptions, who have the integrity to take on the issues and not blink in the face of the massive corruption. And also, I believe we're headed toward economic collapse. I'm doing a whole program on that coming up. We have someone on the phone who just called in. Her name is Isil. Let's say hello to Isil. Hi, Isil. Hello, Gary. Isil, put the phone up. It sounds like you're talking on a speaker uh, so we can hear you clearly, all right? Okay. You have something to tell us. Tell us what you want to share with us. Um, let's let's start with my daughter. Um, she uh, was a full-term birth, natural birth, and... By the age of nine months, she was walking. By the age of one year, she was talking two, three-word sentences. And when she was three, um, I decided to put her into a preschool because she was such an advanced child. Um, At this point, my daughter developed having seizures. And she is 16 now. And we have been through five doctors, eight diagnoses, two hospitals, and um, none of these people could get my daughter seizure free. Um, she was on 13 different types of, of medicines, and in June, she decided to jump out of a third-story window. And at that point is when I called you and Luann to get a protocol started with her. She was weighing probably 70 pounds at that moment, and um, we started the protocol. In the meantime, uh, we went up to Cleveland Clinic, and there was seven doctors that involved on her plan. And they noticed from last year to this year, uh, her seizures have tremendously decreased. And that was only being on the protocol for a week. Um, Beforehand, she had um, an IEP, which is for a learning disability. Her um, mentality was probably about a seven-year-old. And um, How old is is your daughter? 
She's 16 now. Okay, so she had to, her learning ability, and what else? She was not, from what I understand, she was not able to make eye contact. She held her head down. She was not yes. not able to communicate. Absolutely. And, right. and, and if you did get any kind of communication from her, it was of, um, of, a, of a, talking to a seven-year-old. Um, she was also incontinent at night. Um, but with uh, the visit to Cleveland, they noticed that there was a tremendous difference in her. And um, since then, we haven't, uh, we've come down to three medications, and we are still weaning off of the medications because she has been seizure free since our visit to Cleveland Clinic, and that was in the beginning of July. She's also gained 15 pounds since she's been on the protocol and is growing. She is making eye contact. She is having um, appropriate conversations as a teenager would. And uh, to be a mother and to hold your child while they're tremoring and there's nothing you can do for it except what these doctors are telling you to um, give her all these medications, which in turn affected everything else. Um, now that she's on the protocol, we have a completely different child. Um, she's making eye contact. She's communicating. It, it, it's just a tremendous feeling being a mother of a sick child, and there was nothing that you could do for her until we switched her to the protocol, which is a healthier way of dealing with the seizure activity compared to all the drugs and all the side effects that came along with it. Uh, a lot of this a lot of the medicines that she was on was um, the side effects would be suicide. Now, I don't believe that she was trying to commit suicide, but she was having impulsive thinking and not realizing the consequences of what would have happened to her, especially jumping out of a third-story window. All right. How many seizures was she having prior to uh, me giving you the protocol? She was having 60, between... 40 to 60 a night. 40 to 60 seizures every night? Every night. For, what, uh, 13 years? Thir yes, 13 years. And in any given moment, one of those seizures could have caused an embolism and she could have died. Yes. So you took her to the Cleveland Clinic. She saw all this whole team of specialists in seizures. They had her on 13, you said 13 medications? Yes, 13 different medications. Okay, and that wasn't helping. That caused uh, impulsivity where she just simply walked out of a third-story window, fortunately did not kill herself, which she could easily have done at that height. Yes. Okay. Most definitely. So now she hasn't had a single seizure. She's gained the weight that she had lost. She was cachexic. She, uh, yes. she can communicate, and uh, she is living a normal life. Yes, and since she has been seizure-free, she is your typical teenager. She wants to drive, and since she is seizure-free, she has to be seizure-free for six months. And at this point, like I said, we weaned off of uh, 10 of the medicines, and we are still weaning off of the last three of the medicines. What have your doctors said since they've seen such a radical change? Um, at first, when I showed them all of the uh supplements that I were given what I was given her they said well we don't think that that's going to make a big of a difference but once they saw the EEG um, that showed that her seizures has dramatically decreased compared to last year um, they wanted to they want to know more of what she is taking what she is doing and what's the difference and I let them know that we are juicing we are vegan uh, she's got very, very little uh, screen time and um, and all the supplements that we are using. Okay, good. Let's hope that they're open-minded enough to call me, in which case I'm happy to talk with them. I have an open-door policy. I, I will speak with any physician or public health official or nurse, and I do this anyhow, but there's a barrier, and it's not a simple barrier. The solution is simple. But the complexity to learning something new means you have to surrender what you have used. 
because it's all that you've been conditioned to believe can be done. You see, we should have democracy in healthcare. There should be multiple different approaches where people have an opportunity to share their points of view, and we can see what works, what doesn't work. But right now, we don't have that because of so-called science-based medicine that says only what orthodox medicine accepts can be used. So if they are not able to cure a single patient using their techniques and methods, uh, and we're able to reverse disease using a completely different paradigm, then they're going to reject it. There's too much involved. There's too much ideological issues involved. People don't want to admit that they've been treating their patients incompletely or wrongly or putting them at harm. And that means they could also be more susceptible to litigation being sued. So that's, ne- that's a no-brainer. That's, they're never going to acknowledge that. But then you also have the conditioning factor. People cannot have two different belief systems working simultaneously. The dominant one will always collapse all the other ones, even if what is dominant is the negative, if it doesn't work. And we've seen that. I've seen that my entire career. So I'm glad that at least you, as an empowered mother, because uh, I remember the call that came at uh, almost midnight, and uh, I was on the road, and Luann called says, there's a crisis here. And I uh, called you back, and we got you started. So I'm glad to see your daughter has no more seizures, is gaining weight, is happy, can function, can communicate, holds her head up, and the other things that make a difference. Anything else that I should know, this audience should know? Um, um, well, as far as my daughter, I think I think we covered everything about her. Um, and the main reason I came to you guys was um, I had my own uh problems, health problems. And I, I, I saw the difference that you guys made in me. And so I, I knew that there was a better answer than um, just pills for my daughter. For myself, um, I came to you guys with end stage breast cancer. Um, I weighed 87 pounds. I was living the American lifestyle. Um, you know, we all sit on our, our become couch potatoes and we stare at the TV and the TV tells us what to eat and what to drink and everything that they're advertising on the TV is what's actually killing us. Um, the garbage food, um, pop is, is disgusting all the way around. Um, and, uh, not dealing with our stress. Well, I'm, I'm so, running out of time, so please make your point, whatever it is. Okay. Um, basically my point was, I. Uh, I came to you guys, I weighed 87 pounds, I had end-stage cancer, and as of now, I have been cancer-free for over a year, and I weigh 114 pounds, and I'm blessed that um, if we didn't deal with the stress and the lifestyle and the eating and all that, I believe that I would not be on this earth. Well, we're all and fortunate think- you are, and your daughter's uh, happy that you are. So thank you, Isol, for coming on and sharing your points of view. We're out of time, everyone, but uh, as a fundraiser for our sister station, WBAI, that is uh, going through some challenging time right now to raise money to pay its bills, uh, if you want to join us the last two weeks of October, and that's it. I don't know if we're going to do any more because there's going to be repurposing of the place where it's done. Uh, but this is this is the only one that's planned for the future. So call Luann, see if it, you're qualified, and you can be helped. And we encourage healthy people, too. It's not just sick people. It's people of all backgrounds, walks of life, who just want a quality time away where they can learn about the issues that are important to them and do so in a healthy, peaceful, stress-free environment. Her number is 903-881-7008, 903-881-7008. Thank you all for listening, and have a nice day.